A 13-year-old transgender child wrote to me. A 10-year-old transgender girl named Ella. Hateful laws introduced across the country. The right to make our own health care decisions. Puberty blockers are wonderful. The right to raise our own children. One of the drugs used is Lupron, right? Which mm -hmm. To protect their child. Mm -hmm. That's why we must pass the Equality Act. Who the hell? Oh. In this speech, Joe Biden makes several worrying statements that are important to highlight, considering the effects his statements have. This video points out the most troubling statements and what they mean for the world. If you like the video, you can help the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Time to get the show on the road. To everyone who helped make Respect for Marriage Act a reality, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Euphemizing language is one of the ways politicians make policies, and especially controversial policies, sound moral and good. By referring to his policy as Respect for Marriage Act, Biden makes his side sound morally superior, while making his opponents sound like they don't respect marriage. Euphemisms are an effective way to control the agenda and create a protagonist-antagonist framework in the process. And together, we're standing up for children. I get letters literally from children and parents terrified by what they're, what's happening all across America. Biden wants people to associate the term freedom with his side. The best way to do that is to make his opponent sound like they deny people the right to freedom. With the verb terrify, Biden appeals to the audience's emotion and pity. However, what is it people should have the freedom to do? And what are these terrified parents like? Perhaps parents who post TikToks to brand themselves as progressive. So she was a designated, assigned, observed male at birth. So when I would go to pick her up from preschool, like I said, she would be dripping in, you know, just jewelry and clicky shoes and all kinds of stuff. And getting her to take that off to go home was usually a pretty gnarly struggle. Uh, and then pr around the age of four, she had this one headband she was completely attached to that she felt, I, I look back on it now and think to myself, gosh, I wonder when she put that, that headband on, she thought to herself, people see me for who I am. No one's going to misgender me now. First of all, Nali struggle could say something about bad ways of communicating and or a lack of patience. Secondly, this isn't how a four-year-old thinks. This is adult language. So these are her thoughts, what she wants to be the case for her child. This is important to keep in mind because Biden doesn't reflect on any of that. Instead he goes on with a synecdoche, a small part of a problem that's used to represent the whole, most often for emotional effect. A 13-year-old transgender child wrote to me, said, I hate looking at the news. I hear adults much older than me debate about my existence when they don't even know me. Biden obviously thinks this is a good point, but it's not because it can be used against him. Because he doesn't know this person either, in case we can trust that this is a real person, that is. He doesn't know the parents or any other circumstances, yet this is the kind of unspecific synecdoche that politicians use to persuade people emotionally on a daily basis. Uh, Sarah McBride gave me a note from a 10-year-old transgender girl named Ella. She named herself that after my movie Ella Enchanted. Um, and in this note, in this note, Ella thanked me for my courage as an ally. It takes zero courage to love you. Not only is Biden's synecdoche unspecific as a whole, it's also internally unspecific. What does debate about my existence mean? Everybody has and is allowed to have existence. The discussion is about at what age children, who aren't old enough to smoke a drink obviously, should be allowed to make life-altering decisions. With this lack of specificity, Biden conveniently oversimplifies the discussion. He's making it all about emotions. Our message to young people across America must be unequivocal. You're loved, you're heard, and you're understood, and you belong. I mean it. And we see who you are, made in the image of God, deserving dignity, respect, and support. I mean it. Of course, he means it. As a politician, he wouldn't dream of saying anything he doesn't mean, right? He wouldn't dream of advocating for issues that he knows will be popular with his voting base. That you are the beacon of light around the world, not a joke. Not a joke. 
not a joke. On a surface level, what Biden says can sound captivating. However, the key word here is surface level. First of all, he delivers these seemingly encouraging messages right after he's avoided mentioning specifics. Thus, the messages are so generic that they become hollow. Secondly, he ignores that love isn't about supporting anything and everything a child, or any person for that matter, says, does, and believes. Love is also about caring for the person you love, and caring doesn't mean greenlighting all decisions and any type of behavior. That's carelessness. Thus, the issue isn't about being loved, heard, and understood, as Biden has an interest in oversimplifying it as. The issue is about whether or not it's a good idea for parents to send their children to pediatricians who are paid good money to pretend not to know what objective reality is. Santa Claus is real for them, but yeah. Santa Claus is not actually real. Yeah, well, and, but Santa Claus does deliver their Christmas presents. Well, yeah, but he's not real, though. To that child, they are. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs? That's a, we that's assume they're female if they lay eggs. In truth, okay. Whose truth are we talking about? The same truth that says we're sitting in this room right now, you and I. No, you're not listening. You're not listening, the pediatrician says, which echoes Biden's word choice about being heard. They're monopolizing terms and phrases that make it sound like morality belongs to them. And with his religious reference, Biden lays it on thick. Made in the image of God! His logic goes, because a person's made in the image of God, people should support his or her actions. This line of reasoning can be applied to other areas of life in a logically consistent way, because in other areas, we don't support someone's decision for this reason. If we think about the criminal justice system, for example, we should set boundaries. Who's to decide what's right and wrong? Whose truth are we talking about? Biden's oversimplification tactic continues. But for all the progress we made, we know the barriers, the bias, the bigotry still exist. Perhaps because of the progress we've made, people want to push us back and pull us back. According to critical discourse analysis, the vast majority of what we consider to be good and bad is a result of discourses upon discourses that are results of societal developments financially, structurally, and morally. When a certain discourse wins, say, democracy and capitalism, it becomes the hegemony, the winning discourse. In a similar vein, there's a battle today about what constitutes progress. In that regard, repetition is a powerful rhetorical device for politicians to make people associate progress with their side of the aisle. Progress, progress, progress. So the, the progress is to keep making progress. The bias, the bigotry. Prejudice is a synonym to bigotry. So what about Biden's own bias and prejudice? Is he the only person in the world without bias? All his arguments rest on biases about what he wants love and support to mean in the context he's referring to. By implying that it's only his opponents who are biased, he makes it look like he's merely speaking the truth, when the truth is he's presupposing what the truth is, based on his biases. But who's Biden to judge what's true and what's not? Whose truth are we talking about? And with the pronoun we, he's making it sound like he's not alone, but that this entire community that he's trying to constitute via the speech speaks the only truth there is. We made. We know that we've made. After monopolizing the term progress or trying to, it's time to monopolize the vague term hate or trying to. Over 600, 600 hateful laws introduced across the country. More than 70 of them becoming law just this last year, denying the existence of transgender people, silencing teachers, banning books, threatening parents with prison for getting their children health care. Families across the country now face excruciating decisions to move to a different state to protect their child from dangerous anti-LGBTQ laws. What Biden oversimplifies as hateful and dangerous for obvious self-serving reasons is what many people would call care and concern. This goes to show that two people can use the same word and mean two completely different things. Thus, it's the definitions of words that matter. So what about Biden's definitions? Are they convincing? For getting their children health care. This is vague language, similar to euphemizing language for what this particular kind of health care entails. A, a kiddo who is just starting puberty, puberty blockers are wonderful because we can put that pause on puberty, just like if you were listening to music. One of the drugs used is Lupron, right? Which... Mm -hmm. Silencing teachers, banning books, 
Here, Biden makes sure to monopolize the terms silenced and banned. These are terms that his opponents often use as talking points, so it's about using them before they're used against him and his allies. He needs the terms to keep the victim narrative on his side, to ensure the right effect of his many appeals to people's emotion and pity. To protect their child from and what is protection? Parents who assess their child's gender based on their attachment to headbands. She had this one headband she was completely attached to that she, no one's going to misgender me now. Or maybe consulting certain pediatricians. Whose truth are we talking about? And the most interesting point, Biden's unwillingness to even begin to define what he's arguing for. According to the worldview he represents, what does gender even mean? How does he even begin to define a man or a woman without upsetting the crowd whose votes he wants? Next, it's time for another synecdoche to get the audience riled up, distracting from the absence of definitions. It's all about how people feel. I received a letter from one mom who wrote me, quote, I despair for families like mine who already become refugees inside our nation. Refugees inside our nation? That's how she feels, like a refugee inside our nation. People feel things all the time. It doesn't necessarily make what they feel true or right. It's not an argument for or against anything. If this organization, Human Rights Campaign, got their way, even more people would feel like refugees. But that's how pathos appeals work. They're designed to leave out specifics and reflections. It's all about getting people riled up by using and repeating certain terms. And speaking of riling up, next Biden intensifies the rhetoric against the common enemy. Biden's word choice underlines the hegemony battle, the right to define what progress means. And the United States Congress, extreme MAGA Republicans trying to undo virtually every bit of progress we've made. Ban pride flags from flying on public lands. Who the hell? Oh. <laughs> Not very presidential. Next, he invokes the concept of democracy, a classic, but also quite extreme move. And these are just the cruel attacks on the LGBT community. They're attacks on the foundations of our democracy. You know, they take aim at our fundamental values and principles, like the right to free expression, the right to make our own health care decisions, the right to raise our own children. Again, he uses nice sounding terms and phrases. Like the right to free expression, the right to make our own health care decisions, the right to raise our own children. With these terms and phrases, he ignores what they entail. This isn't regular healthcare decisions. This isn't just about free expression or the right to raise children. It's about at what age someone should make life-altering decisions. He obviously knows that, but he can't allow himself to reflect on anything that goes against his oversimplification tactic. I'm never going to stand by and watch families terrorized, doctors and nurses criminalized or any child targeted who for who they are. It's who they are. Who they are, or who they're made to believe they are. Maybe as a result of the books that are being promoted in schools and not banned, as Biden claimed. Banning books. Maybe as a result of a pediatrician's carefully phrased adult questions. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is, tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? Jill and I, Kamala and Doug, and our entire administration will always stand with you against hate. Together we're going to make even more progress. Hate and progress. I'm starting to notice a pattern for Biden's oversimplification tactic. This way, hate is any parent who denies what their child feels. So does he really want families to make their own healthcare decisions? Not if it goes against anyone's feelings, apparently. That's why we must pass the Equality Act and pass it now. That's why we must do this. By monopolizing the term equality, he implies that anything other than accepting this act means that you're supporting inequality. So much for being loving, unbiased, and for free expression. Because history has taught us again and again anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, they're all connected. Hate toward one group left unanswered opens the door for more hate toward more groups more often readily. 
Not only is he mixing different categories together, he's also making it sound like it's the same group that's responsible for these isms and phobias. He's appealing to history without a hint of grounds for his claims. Looking at what went before this passage, what Biden calls phobias to conveniently avoid actual argumentation, is what many or most people would call concern for their children and children in general. The antidote to hate is love. The answer to twisted dehumanizing ideology is solidarity. In this context, words like love and solidarity are empty because the words could just as easily be used against him. That his kind of love is carelessness and that he's not showing solidarity with people who disagree with him.